Today is Monday, March 8, 2010. My name is Julian Reitman, and it is my pleasure to interview today Ron Marcus at the Stanford Historical Society as part of the Oral History Archive of the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County. And as you know, I have been looking forward to this day. Yes, you have. <laughs> To start, Ron, uh, you're, you were born in Stanford. Yes. And your parents, were they Stanford or they came to Stanford? Um, they both came to Stanford. And why did they come to Stanford? Well, my dad came to Stanford in 1911 because this is, they came from Romania. And after a brief stay in Stanford, they ended up in, and New York, they ended up in Stanford. Uh, people come to a community usually for two reasons. Uh, either they have relatives in the community or employment or both. Uh, my father had, didn't have any relatives here, but uh, he came to Stanford and, and why Stanford? Why not another community? That's always some, something interesting. My grandfather, my, my, my paternal grandfather was a blacksmith. And he immediately uh, obtained work in New York and was shoeing horses and doing fine. And uh, there was a gentleman who was a dealer in horses who would buy them in communities in Fairfield County and ship them down to New York. And he was watching my grandfather shoeing horses uh, in New York. And he liked, he commented, he complimented him on his work. And he said he could use someone like him. And my grandfather said, but I already have a job. He said, yes, he says, I know how much I'm paying you, but I could pay you more. My grandfather said, I'm listening. And so uh, he offered him uh, to, even offered the, the family tradition, is he even offered to pay the expenses to move the family to this place called Stamford, Connecticut. And that's how the family ended up here. And did the family associate as being Jewish in, in the community, or they were secular? Uh, no, they, they belong to the only shul in Stanford, a Gota Shalom, and uh, they they were um, uh, uh, observed. I think my grandmother was more observed than my grandfather. In that in that sense, I think my grandfather was a little bit more sec. In fact, I think he was rather secular, uh, but my grandmother was not. My grandmother uh, kept kosher. My grandmother uh, went to synagogue all the time, and she was also active in the. Uh, um, Oh, the um, what is it, the Hebrew ladies' mm -hmm. um, educational league, and uh, she was active in that as well. And uh, you then not went to Stanford schools. Yes. And which uh, elementary school? I went to. Um, I attended the uh, Hart School, and then I went to uh, Burdick. Uh, junior high school, now called middle school. And then I graduated from Stanford High School class in 1959. Did you have any episodes of anti-Semitism in all of the education? Hmm. No, I don't believe I did. I've never been asked that, but uh, that's why the I'm not hesitating on answering. I'm just thinking. No, I don't think I did. And goodness knows, um, at that time in Stanford, I mean, uh, we had a very, very, very diverse um, uh, population. And uh, after you graduated from Stanford High, what did you do then? Then I, I, I had several uh, jobs um, in, in, in the community in several places, but then I, I, I went to work for the Macklet Laboratories in Springdale. I was working, uh, make, building prototypes, making prototypes, assembling prototypes. And then I had a wonderful opportunity. There was an opening for uh, the glass blowing department. And that's where I learned uh, to be a scientific glass blower. People ask me, what is a scientific glass blower? Well, 
uh, there's a difference. Uh, I'm not one of those master craftsmen that you see at, at Stuben uh, who make punch bowls and, and uh, other uh, forms of art glass. I, I, I made x-ray tubes and uh, it's a scientific instrument and I actually uh, had the good fortune to learn this skill. It was very hard. It was, it was, it was sort of an apprenticeship, if you will. And, uh, I had to watch and I was the, the department um, uh, uh, the gopher, go to the stock room, <laughs> take this to a different department. Yes, go for coffee too. And eventually, I worked with, with scrap glass, and um, and I made mistakes, of course, and burnt myself and cut myself. And, but eventually, I learned the skill, and I was employed there for until they closed. And it was a very, very interesting uh, company to work for. Was there one particular individual who was your mentor? Um. It's hard to say. I had several uh, mentors within the company. Probably the the fellow who who really taught me more than anything else was my was my group leader. His name is Bob Leonetti, and he was a he, he was is still living. Thank goodness. Uh, a really a, a master glass blower. Ex very skilled, highly skilled man. And uh, did Macklin have many Jews? Hmm. Not that many. Uh, let's see. There was a fellow named um, uh, uh, Morris Goodwin who worked, uh, I believe, in the stockroom. I'm not sure what he did. Morris Goodwin. Uh, Charlie Baum was an engineer. Uh, Abe Eisenstein, he worked in the assembly department, I believe, as a supervisor. Um, hmm. I can't think of any others uh, off the top of my head, but uh, there may have been others. You know, there were three shifts <coughs> going constantly at this company. Uh, the majority worked uh, the normal hours, but, but there there's um, considerable um, amount of testing of, of um, x-ray tubes. They have to run for great lengths of time. They have to be very closely monitored. And this is something that goes 24-7. And there, there, were, there were people on sometimes in third shift I would see perhaps maybe once or twice a year. Uh, uh, you know, uh, but the majority of the, the, the employees worked um, between, between 7 a.m. and 4 or 5 p.m. And there were approximately, the, the number of employees fluctuated. It would be between 900 to 1,200 uh, employees, depending upon how busy we were. Were, were you at uh, Macklin with the beryllium episode was there, or that was late before your time? I was <coughs> well aware of um, the hazards of beryllium. But uh, the 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 uh, the damage had already been done uh, by the time I got there. Apparently, uh, the real damage occurred during World War II, when <coughs> they were not really. I don't believe they really understood the, the, the potential hazards for it. And in the machine shop, especially, you had you had uh, fellows working with surface grinders, just grinding the stuff and the dust all over them. And yet, surprisingly, a number of them never got sick. And there was one woman who worked in the front office who maybe two or three times a week she would go to the machine shop foreman's desk to pick up paperwork and deliver paperwork, and she, she, she came down with beryllium poisoning. So it's like anything else. It's, it's hard to say. But by the time I, I arrived, it was, it was well under control. There was a separate room for it. They had to, it was sort of an airlock. They had to change clothes and, and uh, wear masks and all that sort of thing. They, uh, so, and I, I never, I never worked with it. Uh, and when did you get married? June of 1968. So you were well along at that point. Well, yes, I was, but uh, <clears throat> I just wasn't ready. And then you continue to live in Stanford? Yes. Still do. Still do. 
And where did you acquire your fascination with history? Hmm. Uh, that, that goes back to, um, oh my goodness, um, this is one of the five people I mentioned to you. Um, it was, there was a, in, in my, I had a friend who had a paper route, route. And one of the people on, his, on the paper route <coughs> lived at, on, on Summer Street near the corner of North. I lived at 92 North. And this lady was fascinating. Her name was Miss Sarah Mead Webb. How's that for a Yankee name for you? <coughs> and Miss Webb's house backed up to the North Field or North Street Cemetery. And uh, I would go with my friend and uh, she would uh, she'd be, usually had a collie dog with her. She always had a collie dog with her. And um, uh, Sometimes we would see her in the cemetery and we would wave to her and, and so on. And then sometimes she would tell, tell us things about the people who were buried there and that sort of thing. So it, 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 didn't be, it, wasn't, a, um, it wasn't a scary place at all. Be between that and my, my, my dad being, um, at one point, uh, chairman of the Independence Stanford Lodge's Cemetery, uh, between those... Uh, <laughs> Miss Webb and my dad always running to the cemetery for some sort of business. Uh, cemeteries were not a, 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 a fearsome place. And so I, I, I became interested. And Miss Webb would, would always be telling me these fascinating th stories about uh, various individuals who were interred in uh, the Northfield Cemetery, and, uh, from revolutionary soldiers straight on through to um, um, people from the 1930s and 40s. And it was fascinating hearing her tell these stories. She was a... Um, what we would call a professional volunteer. She never really had to work. Uh, uh, she would have been, uh, she studied for the law, uh, at, uh, and, but unfortunately she never took the bar exam because she was one of two children and uh, she had a sister who was married, she was single, her parents became suddenly quite ill so it fell for her to take care of her parents. It went on for many years. By the time that was through she just, she just gave it up, unfortunately. But she, she volunteered for many, many organizations in Stanford, uh, usually as parliamentarian. Uh, and uh, one of them was the Historical Society. And I, that's probably how I became involved with the Historical Society, through Miss Webb and one other individual uh, now, now at, you at mentioned the library. Your father was, was he, your father also giving you an interest in history? No, actually my dad didn't have any interest in history whatsoever. He, his his interests um, were in, in sports and uh, in playing poker, actually. <laughs> he, he loved poker. So, uh, you mentioned, do you want to talk about the Ferguson Library next? Yes. Um, the, uh, another individual who had quite an influence on me. Um, as far as I can remember, I, I remember just going to the, to the Torah Public Library. My mother would bring me there. My mother would read to me all the time. And then she encouraged me to uh, take out books. And in the reference department, there was uh, an incredible woman. Her name was Miss Grace Hope Walmsley. Miss Walmsley was head of reference. She was there. It was her one and only uh, library position in her whole working career. Uh, she, um, she was there for over half a century uh, at the Ferguson Library. They had a mandatory retirement age in, in years ago and they just uh, retained her as a consultant and just kept her on because it, it, would have been, it would have been cruel to just push her out the door. The library was her life. She was one of these extraordinary librarians. She didn't need a catalog. She just knew. She read uh, three newspapers every day. The, the Advocate, the Christian Science Monitor, and the New York Times, and she, she just was just phenomenal. I mean, we, we knew when, when we were in high school, we would know that, you know, let's ask Miss Walmsley, she might have said, if you had to know what the gross national product of Madagascar was, you know, she, she would know. But she was interested in, primarily interested in New England history, uh, ornithology, uh, the American Revolution, um, many, many uh, things. The American Civil War, she was quite, quite uh, knowledgeable on the American Civil War. And uh, she encouraged me to, um, she brought to my attention, rather, uh, 
I will never forget it. And, and she, she told me once that that there are things about the history of our community that are in books, not necessarily devoted to the history of Stanford per se. She showed me a, uh, a wonderful book called uh, Barber's Connecticut Historical Collections, and there are woodcut uh, uh, views of Connecticut towns and cities in it, and in it is the, the earliest known view of Stanford, and she showed it to me, and she said, she said, if you go to a catalog under Stanford, you would never find this, but this is, this is the earliest known view of Stanford, it still remains the earliest known view of Stanford. And she brought that to my attention. I was fascinated. And um, uh, we talked a lot. We discussed books. She recommended books to me all the time. Um, and I think between her and uh, Miss Webb, uh, I think because of these two remarkable women that I, I became, um, uh, I started volunteering at the Historical Society at a very young age. I was thinking it was about 12, 13. The Historical Society at that time was located? At the Hoyt Barnum House in downtown Stanford at 713 Bedford Street, which it still is. Right. And uh, did this tie in with what you were studying in school? Not really. <laughs> Not really. We had to study a little bit. I remember in, uh, in social studies in junior high school, middle school now, that we had to study about the history of our community, but just a brief time, and that was it. Uh, although I must say it was interesting when we, we were in high school and we had to we, we went in depth about the the colonial era. It was interesting being in an actual house that was uh, standing in the time of the French and Indian War, and, and it gave me I think a, a better idea of how people really lived. Before television, before radio, before Central Heat, before all these things, you know that we we love and take for granted. You mentioned your social studies teacher uh, Joseph Shawinsky. Yes, oh yes, Mr. Shawinsky. Uh, again, uh, they're one of these people who just so influenced my life. He <laughs> he was my social studies teacher in junior high school. And he, he, just, he was just one of these dynamic teacher who, teachers who inspired you to learn. Uh, he never um, showed favoritism to, to any of, his, of the pupils. Uh, he was very, very fair. He was a hard marker, but a fair one. Uh, if you had problems comprehending something or didn't understand, you could always stop by after school and, and, uh, and, and he would spend the time with you. Uh, one time he gave us an assignment which, which really sort of focused my attention on history. We had to write a one-page essay on how we would handle the situation if we were George Washington. The situation was that you're the commander-in-chief of an army at Valley Forge. Your men are very loyal, but they're hungry. Uh, you might overlook an occasional chicken or two that they filch from the farmers in the area, but you didn't want them to go too far in, in what is termed foraging uh, the farms in the area because they were not that far from the British lines and the British had hard silver coin to pay for uh, the farmers, whereas all George Washington had was paper continental money of dubious value. The question was, the essay was, how would you handle the situation? And all of a sudden, Wow, George Washington wasn't the the, the, the grim-looking guy on the dollar bill. You know, he, he was a he was a real person with a real problem. So our entire class descended down on the Ferguson Library, and and Miss Walmsley and others, you know, tried to help us uh, answer this. It, it was a very very hard assignment, especially for middle school. But but it made us really think that history was real. This was a real man. He isn't some uh, a god. He was a human with a with a with a tremendous problem, and. Um, uh, Mr. Shawinsky really uh, made us think, and he inspired us. Um, it's kind of funny. I, I, he's still alive, thank God, and he, I, I occasionally see him. And I, once he said, he said, Ron, he said, you don't, you can call me Joe, you know. No, I said, I can't. You're Mr. Shawinsky. <laughs> and, uh, just a remarkable man, a veteran of World War II, and uh, he was interviewed for Tony Pavia's book on the uh, 
uh, World War II veterans of, of uh, Stanford. And I noticed you also uh, mentioned Estelle Feinstein. Ah, uh, uh, Estelle Feinstein. Uh, of course, I met her many, many years after. I mean, I was already very active in the historical society. Uh, and I met her when she was working on her doctoral dissertation at Columbia University. And she was researching um, Stanford uh, in the time period from 1868 to 1893. And uh, the title of her dissertation and later her book was uh, is Stanford in the Gilded Age. And it's a, um, it's a, uh, it was well received and reviewed by her peers in the professional historical journals. And uh, through my own research, uh, I have found out that of all the books published on, uh, of all the books dealing with the history of Stanford, there are more copies of Estelle Feinstein's Stanford in the Gilded Age in libraries throughout the United States than any other book on Stanford history. She just was absolutely, a, I, I never had the good fortune to have her as a, as a teacher, but as a friend, uh, and, uh, and she even asked me to um, go with her uh, when she was commissioned by the Stanford Bicentennial Commission in 1973 or four, I think at least 1973, to write a book on the history of Stanford from the founding up to the, the dawn of the American Revolution, Stanford from Puritan to Patriot. And she asked me to go with her as, 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 as a, an assistant, sort of, um, uh, to Yale University to do research. And, and that, was, that was amazing, really. I learned so much from her in those trips to Yale. We made um, four trips up there to the various libraries at Yale University. And uh, I, yes, and, and one trip to the Connecticut State Library in Hartford as well. And I learned so much working for her. Very gracious, very, um, a very pleasant, a very scholarly individual. We owe her a great debt. This whole community does. Did you ever discuss any of the Jewish aspects of Stanford with Estelle? Um, hmm. Because I was thinking of the background of the Koenig book. I don't know. She met. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to suppose. We may have discussed it um, about the the population of, of the Jewish population here during the Gilded Age when um, she was researching that time period, because that was the, the, uh, the period with the establishment of the first synagogue in Stanford. And she may have, but uh, most likely she did, but I, I can't swear to it this, uh, this, this many years later. Then tell us about the Koenig book. Oh, the Koenig book, yes. Well, you had a hand in that too, a big hand in it. Um, <coughs> there is this... Um, famous um, sociologist named uh, Dr. Um, Samuel. Samuel Koenig, who was a sociologist, I believe he was at Yale at the time of the, um, the, um, the uh, during the American Depression. And uh, under his guidance, there was a, there were, there was a sociological study done of the Jews of Stanford, Connecticut, and uh, uh, it was, it, it's really an amazing work. Uh, it was published later on, it, he, well, he did intend to publish it, the WPA was, it appears from the evidence that, uh, that it was all set for publication, but World War II broke out and that was the end of the WPA, and everything was just filed away. Uh, the Connecticut section, fortunately, was saved at the Connecticut State Library in Hartford, and there it remained uh, unpublished until the Jewish Historical Society 
uh, published it and uh, finalized what, what was Dr. Koenig's uh, original intent. And you had a part in that too, yeah, Jerry, but, a large but, part. But how did, uh, how did anybody know that it existed? Well, um, uh, it, uh, the, uh, one copy was, was cataloged and put on the shelf in the local history and genealogical division of the, at the Connecticut State Library, Hartford. And then later on, um, there was a, um, uh, a list of um, various ethnic studies done in Connecticut. Uh, and these lists were placed in different um, historical societies and, and museums and libraries. And I became aware of it in just by serendipity, just, just looking around one day uh, in the reading room at, at, the, uh, at, the, at the local history and genealogical division at the State Library. And I said, oh my goodness, look at this. Wow. And, um, uh, and it was fascinating. And, and um, I, I took notes on it. And um, uh, later on, it was published by the Jewish Historical Society. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a major, major, major publishing achievement. And everyone connected with it should be very proud, including you, Julia. You had a large part in it. I believe you did the index to it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now, when did you become a uh, um, librarian of the Historical Society? Um, I believe it was. I believe it was 1970. Where did you find time? Well. <laughs> Like anything else, you make time, <laughs> you know. Fortunately, fortunately, I, I, I had a very, very, very um, gracious, um, un completely understanding wife. Who uh, there was never any uh, disagreement or disparaging remarks or anything about my activities with the historical society. Uh, <laughs> In fact, sometimes I, I used to say when, you know, a kid about it, I said, you know, when Virginia married me, she married the Stanford Historical Society. <laughs> and, but you know, that, didn't, that didn't bother her, that didn't face her one bit. Uh, she, uh, and I think because of uh, that, I, I, for that alone, many other things, I consider myself very fortunate. Do you want me to say a few things about Virginia? Yes, please. Oh, well, here I could, here I could talk on forever, so I'm... Must be brief, but Virginia. Um, um, How did you meet Virginia? Ah, 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 that's <laughs> that's a very interesting, very very interesting story. Um, at the Stanford Historical Society, not the sort of place one meets their their soulmate, but uh, I guess it happened. Um, uh, it all started with a telephone call. That work I received from Marie Hurley, who was then director of the Ferguson Library, and she told me that they had an affidavit testifying to the good character of a woman from Stanford who was accused of being a witch in 1692, the same year as the Salem trial. It was given to the library by a manuscript collector. Uh, he didn't particularly care what they did with it, but she said, we don't collect manuscripts. But the, she and the trustees felt it should stay here, and so she asked me the most moot question ever presented to me: Would we like it? <laughs> and of course, I mean, I mean, the library could have called Yale, Harvard, Princeton, State Library in Hartford, Library of Congress, uh, the Essex Institute in Salem. They would have sent a delegation to pick it up, but they wanted to remain here. And so, well, I went down there, and, and when something is too good, and you you question it, and no, it's authentic. We compared it with the handwriting of the town clerk at the time and uh, and so um, I wrote a pamphlet on it and it was it was published but before that in 19 so that year we decided to put it on display at the historical society okay so put it on display and I'm doing research uh, on it and uh, with the intention of publishing a pamphlet which which uh, was done in, in 1976 but uh, this is 1967. And along came this, you know, delightful <laughs> young lady with incredible green eyes uh, who asked some very uh, 
interesting and very um, um, uh, thorough questions uh, about the document, about New England witchcraft, about uh, society at that time, uh, and so on and so on and so forth. And that was Virginia. And um, uh, it, as it turns out, she had been working on a, she was active with Connecticut Playmakers, and uh, they had just finished a production on uh, two years ago on Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible. She had been to Salem with her mother and, and uh, all this business. And uh, so uh, we, we just started talking quite a bit, and um, it, we never stopped talking <laughs> since. Uh, and, uh, it, it's, it's, and yet it's very strange about, about how things turned out with that document, not just our marriage, but um, some years later, oh my goodness, this maybe was about 15, 20 years after we were married, uh, she had an aunt who was very interested in genealogy and, and was delighted that, it, that one member of her family was finally interested in it. And Jenny's father's family came from the state of Washington, her mother's family came from Massachusetts, so Aunt Lois sent all this material to Jenny, and she saw looking at it, and she said, wow, look at this. She said, I had an ancestor named Ruth Bishop in the 19th century who lived out in Michigan. Wouldn't it be neat if I were, she were descended of Bridget Bishop of Salem, Massachusetts? I said, well, you never know. Next time uh, we're up at the State Library, take a look. They have a large genealogical collection. She checked several, it's a pretty common name, Bishop. So she checked several of the genealogies at the Ferguson Library, nothing. And then when I was with her, we went up to Hartford and, you know, and um, um, what happened? Oh, so she found out that Bridget Bishop had no issue. Oh, she was mad. She was saying some, some very salty words over that. and. Uh, and I said, well, you know, there's still some others on the, on the cart over there. Why don't you just take a look? And she said, all right. So um, she came back all excited to me. She said, look at this, look at this, look at this. It was a little 12-page pamphlet with a fold-out chart. And at the end of the chart, there was her ancestor, Ruth Bishop. And it took her right back to Stamford, Connecticut. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, she had no idea, no idea. Her father had no idea. Aunt Lois had no idea. They knew that the family was in Michigan. That's all they knew in the 19th century, in the, in the mid-19th century Michigan. But it was the, you know, manifest destiny across the country. And so this, is, this was fascinating. So I said, oh, I said, you know, tell me more what it says. Because she was looking at it. She's reading it to me, quite excited. And so, so really, yes, yes, yes. I said, um, tell me, um, which of the uh, children of the Reverend John Bishop uh, of Stanford, Connecticut, are you descended from? She said, Stephen, why? I said, this is very interesting. Why? I said, well, you know, um, the document that was responsible for you and I meeting each other is signed by two of your ancestors. <laughs> yes. And she just paused and just... I said, yes, yes it is. I said, you know, um, Cotton Mather would, would know exactly how to interpret that, predestination and all this business, but it, it's very interesting. She said, wow, wow, wait till I tell Aunt Lois, you know. And she did, and her aunt was rather pleased about that, to say the least. So, you, know, you never know in this, uh, uh, in, in historical research, where it's going to take you. You just never know. That was fascinating, really, how that turned out. Uh, again, I was fortunate with her. I learned a lot from her. I, I learned about the sea. I'm such a land lover. Um, on our second date, um, we went out, and she said, let's go rowing. I thought to myself, uh-oh. I didn't have the heart to tell her. I, extremely prone to seasickness. She said, you do not a row. I said, no. Okay, I'll teach you. I thought, okay. So there we're going to, to Five Mile River and we're waiting, okay? And there's a place there you can rent a boat. So she's out there, she's showing me how to, how to you know, how to, how to row and, you know, and so on. And so we're going along and she said, are you all right? I said, uh, what makes you think something's wrong? She said, 
your color doesn't look good. And I said, well, or, or, or she said, you're not getting seasick, are you? You can't be getting seasick. This is a mill pond. And she started laughing hysterically, laughing, laughing hard, so hard. I thought, this is it. This is it. This gorgeous green-eyed girl, once we get ashore, she's going to drop me like a rock. She'll never see her again. She'll have nothing to do with me. So she's rowing me back, and I'm sick as a dog. Get ashore. And she said, why didn't you tell me? I muttered something and mumbled something. And she said, you're such a darn good sport. <laughs> Ever since then, uh, we, <laughs> we went out quite a bit and uh, always with Dramamine. <laughs> and that's what, that was one of the things that saved our marriage was, was Dramamine. Turns out I married a woman of the sea. Uh, she was a mariner scout at Mystic Seaport, lived aboard the Joseph Conrad. In those days, they let them climb the rigging right to the crow's nest and right on, on the ends of the yard arms. Uh, um, her, her maternal uh, grandfather was uh, a, a, a vet, naval veteran of World War I, and he was, a, he was an explorer, and, and he bought this huge sloop named the Virginia, and we have pictures of Virginia as a three-year-old at, at the helm of it. Okay. Uh, she had an uncle in the Navy in World War II. He was lost, unfortunately, in the submarine service. Uh, her mother's sister had a harbor, a woman had a harbor pilot's license to, to take this huge sloop in and out of Boston Harbor. I mean, and then, they, then there's me. <laughs> but opposites do attract, and, you know, and, uh, but, uh, you know, and, oh, land, she could swim better than me. She could dive. She was... She was great, <laughs> you know, but opposites attract. But we had this great love, aside from each other, of course, of history, uh, particularly New England history. Uh, and I learned also from her great appreciation of Shakespeare. Uh, it was kind of interesting and sometimes a little bit, uh, particularly Hamlet, uh, sitting with her through a production of Hamlet and she's quietly whispering the entire play, uh, every line a second or two before the, the performers. I thought to myself, my goodness, you know. She's the one who taught me also that uh, in our Western civilization, most of the phrases and quotes that we use in everyday conversation come from two principal sources. The Bible, the Old and New Testament, particularly Proverbs, and Shakespeare. And, uh, and of all the Shakespearean plays, Hamlet has more uh, quotes in everyday language uh, that we use in everyday conversational language. Uh, the play is the thing, to be or not to be. Uh, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Um, uh, though this be madness, there's a method in it. And of course, there's something rot rotten in the state of Denmark. And on and on and on. But um, for a librarian, you know, not to be a borrower? <laughs> <laughs> well, here at the Stanford Historical Society, we do not lend books. So <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, uh, perhaps Polonius' advice to his son uh, reigns here. We do, we, this is a reference library, so we don't lend books here. Uh, has there been much uh, Jewish questions in your tenure here in the library? It depends on how much is how much. I mean, not an overwhelming amount, but we do get we do get inquiries uh, from time to time. But a lot of the inquiries have been have been wonderfully handled by the Jewish Historical Society. So, uh, but before the the creation of the His Jewish Historical Society, I think we had a few more queries that that were handled. Um, it's usually the number one question is usually what is the oldest synagogue in Stanford and when was it founded. And were there any Jews in Stanford before the Cree, before I got a Shalom? Uh, 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 and the and, and and the answer is yes, there were. And we had um, actually, and of course, you know, you have just some wonderful people there, you know, doing just incredible work. You're, most of you sitting here, Erwin uh, 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 Miller, of course, is legendary for his work. Erwin was here uh, many many times. Uh, Examining our um, 
our early tax records because that's where you find uh, the record of people and surprisingly there were there were there were some here quite early quite in the 18th century actually here uh, and we found that from the tax records uh, uh, so um, uh, we do get queries or it's a genealogical query uh, my grandfather came from Russia or from uh, or from from Poland or from Germany in 1895 or 1910 or 1915 and went to work at the Yale Lock Company and uh, uh, could you help us could you help us out with information we said sure we show them the city directories we 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 we, we have the uh, WPA uh, headstone inscription uh, volumes uh, which which list the, the cemeteries in Stanford and Darien and uh, uh, we also tell them about searching uh, the the the, uh, the land records and the, the we do help people that way uh, interested in in uh, the uh, uh, genealogy uh, and we do get queries from from from, from uh, people looking for their for their uh, Jewish heritage here yes absolutely. Yeah, well, the Jewish Historical Society has certainly made a point of it, but I wanted to know you how much. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I wanted to get a sense of, you know, what what uh, the the other community uh, has asked. You know, has there been an interest on the part of some of the churches on the, the different Jewish aspects and things like that? Not so much from the churches. Our our queries from the churches usually are uh, usually about their own history. Right. Uh, uh, it's usually uh, if they're a commemorative year for them, and if a former pastor has been a little too zealous in cleaning things out and uh, not keeping things that they should have, they come to us invariably asking, you know, do we have any additional information? Uh, but nothing so far is um, relationships with the Jewish community that I can think of. Do you remember any contacts with, with Rabbi Goldman at Bethel? He was here a few times, but not that much. He, he came here a couple of times. Um, I don't remember what he was looking He was looking for something, but I, I can't remember what now. It's been a long time. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, We've gone through my list of questions. Now it's your opportunity to spout on something that you think I've omitted. Really? Of course. Really? Um, okay, well, what, what were you being... Uh, the question, of course, about? is... Uh, uh, did you... Uh, how was your involvement with the original Pacific Street effort by... Uh, um, Barbara Hotz and so on. Ah, yes. In fact, didn't that lead to eventually to the creation of the Jewish Historical Society? Yeah. I, th I think that was that was the, um, I think that was the the the, the beginning. Um, I th it was primarily a photographic materials from our photo archives, uh, materials uh, from the city directories. Uh, but mostly the photo archives for, okay. for the Pacific Street. And also, uh, if I knew of any people or, or, or my family knew of any people who had any kind of a, um, a story or relationship with Pacific Street, and of course there's a story in my family about, about every, every Jewish family who came here, let's say before, to Stanford before 1948, has a Pacific Street story. I think so what's yours? Very, well. Your family and then Pacific Street. Um, I was fortunate. Uh, my dad was the last uh, member of his family living who came from Romania when a cousin gave me an idea to do an oral history with my father. Uh, she said, you've helped everybody else. Uncle Dave is the last one who came off the boat from Romania, now living. Only my, his brother, Jack Marcus, was living, and he was born here. And the other thing was my dad took care of his mother. My, my grandfather Marcus died in 1933. 
And uh, so my dad took care of his mother and took her places and shopped for her and things like that. Those were the days when Mama didn't drive a car. And she would tell him things about, about uh, why they came to America. And, and um, he remembered himself coming, but, but just, uh, and why they came to Stanford. Again, why Stanford? And uh, uh, various things uh, about uh, you know, all sorts of families, lore, family t stories. Um, uh, and uh, I was fortunate that I, I, I recorded that uh, my, with, um, and put it, in, in put it down on paper in book form for my family and also a copy for the, uh, the Jewish Historical Society, the Stanford Historical Society, the Ferguson Library, the, the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati, a Library of Congress, of course, and, and, and others. Uh, my dad wasn't rich, he wasn't famous, he wasn't, you know, uh, he was just an average fellow who went to work and paid his taxes and, and raised a family and that sort of thing. The Pacific Street story. Um, how can I, how can I make it brief? Uh, <laughs> um, mm, no, it's, it's too long. It's just too long. It's too, it's too involved. And it, besides, it's in my dad's book. You, you, can, you can read that. Um, the, if I have a, a, another minute, there is one thing, I would, a, a couple of things I'd like There's to say. There's plenty of time. Okay. Um, People come here, as, as I'm sure they come to the Jewish Historical Society too, and they, they're amazed that you want this sort of thing. Oh, I, oh, if I only knew you wanted that, I threw it all out, or you know, mm, this sort of thing. We had an exhibit here about, no, let me go back up. I think all of us in the field of uh, historic preservation, historic research, it have to just constantly keep talking to people about what to say and what they should keep, especially after an elderly relative dies. Of course, you don't go to the, <laughs> to the funeral and say, by the way, you know, <laughs> you don't do that. If you try to just educate people in advance, it's so important. They have no idea. And I can see why circumstances can prevail to where they just, the family wants closure. If it's been a long drawn out illness, particularly with Alzheimer's or cancer, the family just wants the closure. They want closure. And as a result of them wanting closure, which I can understand, we all can understand, we've all been through this before, sometimes they're a little too zealous in cleaning out the apartment, cleaning out the house, and you see these dumpsters outside of houses all the time. And we're certain that, uh, that things are going in those dumpsters that shouldn't. Things like naturalization papers, uh, early passports, photographs, letters, diaries, all sorts of account books and manuscripts. I'm certain, and I, w I wish I were wrong, that these things are going to dumpsters. So it's a matter of just constantly educating the public on this. We had an exhibit on World War II here at the Historical Society, and we had not... We interviewed not only those who um, were listed or drafted from Stanford, but also those who came here after the war. Why not? Uh, they, they served their country. They, made, they contributed to their community. We didn't want to, certainly shouldn't exclude them. And I'll never forget a conversation I had with one that I told him, you know, if you have any, we would tell them all, look, we're not coveting your letters or memorabilia, but please take steps to ensure that when you're no longer around, these things are no, not, will not be thrown out. So I, I mentioned this to a gentleman who was here, and, uh, and he said, um, I said, what difference would my, my letters make? He said, it was just a joke private. I was writing home to my girlfriend here in Stanford. And that's all there was to it. He said, I, I wasn't anybody. Then he proceeded to tell me he was in the Battle of Monte Cassino and, and how he, he wondered how he survived when he, there were men all around him being killed. And he got through it without a scratch. Of course, he said he couldn't write any of that in the letters until afterwards. The mail was censored, but still. So, but he said, he said, he said, I managed to sneak a few things in the letters <laughs> and to his girlfriend. Okay? So I said to him, I said, you know, if somebody came here with a box of letters written during the, by a Joe Private during the American Civil War 
people would start gushing going, oh, look at the Civil War letters, wow, wow. I said to him, I said, you know, there's that Joe Private during the American Civil War is no different than you. You both serve your country. The only difference is time. And in time, and not too distant at that, those letters of World War II, even now, are just as valuable as those letters during the American Civil War. And he looked at me rather strangely. I thought, oh, did I, you know, touch a nerve because, you know, with with, with, with veterans, sometimes you have to be very careful because you don't know if you might say something that may just trigger something that you shouldn't have overstepped your bounds and so on. A lot of them don't want to talk and you can't ask them, certainly. And, and then he started laughing. I said, something funny. He said, he said, um, he said, I gave him, he said, apparently I gave him an idea. Then he proceeded to tell me, he said, he had a grandson who was, I think, 28 or 29 who the past few years has been asking him all sorts of questions about his service during the war. And he said, would you believe he even wanted my dog tags? He said, I gave him my dog tags. I said, that's the person to give those letters to. That grandson will make sure that they are not disposed of, if he's interested enough to want your dog tags. And he thanked me, and he shook my hand over that. And, uh, and that, was, that gave me such a wonderful feeling, knowing that, because his initial response, reaction was that, you know, you know who, who the hell, you say that, who the hell care about my letters? I was just a joke private. Well, that, that's not the point. And I think reaching out to the public constantly to tell them this, yes, you can't reach them all. And even if you th could reach them all, there is apathy. There is um, uh, total... Uh, feeling of, well, well, I'm just a Joe Private, but that's not the point. Uh, the Joe Privates are in the majority <laughs> in all the conflicts our country has been in. And I think that's so important. I think it's, I think the work that our respective organizations have done over the years, if you, we both look back at what we've acquired, and I, we all know of stories of how both our organizations have acquired stuff just a hair's breadth away from that dumpster. And it, it gives me, and as I'm sure it gives both of you, tremendous satisfaction knowing that what we've saved. And people say, well, okay, what use is it? You know, who's going who's gonna to look at this stuff? What use is it? I always like to think of, of Ben Franklin's, and you, probably, you both probably know this story, who had witnessed the, he was in France, and Ben Franklin witnessed the, um, the I believe, one of the first, if not the first, uh, balloon ascent. And of course, there was always a skeptic everywhere. And the skeptic said to Franklin, you know, or else the scholars, oh, what use is that, a balloon? And Franklin wisely said, of what use is it? Of what use is a newborn babe? And you never know. I mean, I'll give you an example. Somebody, a, a reporter, um, some years ago, I, uh, somebody came in here with the photographs and papers of a racing pigeon club here in Stanford. Okay, a racing pigeon club. And I received some snickers about, you know, several of my committee members here, like, you know, who would ever want to look about pigeons, you know? Well, you never know. And this past year, there was a reporter here who was going to do a feature article about pigeon, racing pigeons here in Stanford and uh, examined these materials and found them of some use uh, here. So you never know. I mean, racing pigeons. Who would, I mean, just for an example, I'm just saying some, 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 some strange sort of a, a collection. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, you, and of course people say, you know, do you want everything? No, you, you don't want everything. You can't say, not even the Library of Congress says everything close, but not everything. But it, it's, you have to be selective and you have to be diplomatic to people. And sometimes people are so, they, they can't understand why you don't want, they honestly, genuinely can't understand why you don't want the, their old geographics, why you don't want their encyclopedias, but there's so much knowledge in them and, and they want to give them to you. And even the Friends of Ferguson Library 
don't wish old encyclopedias anymore. You can't give them away, and we we've had to turn people down on that. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, you you have to also be diplomatic with people too. But uh, now that you mentioned the historical society, uh, Dr. Benjamin Lemoyne had been president of the historical society here. Yes, he had. And uh, can you tell us some stories about uh, Bernie? Oh, Bernie Lemoyne. Oh. Uh, we all love Bernie Nemoyton. <laughs> he was he was a, a, a real extrovert. I mean, Bernie Nemoyton um, was uh, just an incredible person. He, um, of course, his dad was a living legend here in Stanford. We had an exhibit about him, and I worked with it was it was a great pleasure. I was co-chair with Lester Charlock on an exhibit on Dr. Nemoyton. Oh, I, I should mention that too, but I'll, I'll get back to that. I'd like to get back to that about the exhibit on Dr. Nemoy. It was, it was it was a high point in my life working on the exhibit. Bernie. Bernie was key to that exhibit because this was, excuse me, Dr. Jacob Nemoy had only one child, and, and that was Bernie, who also became a, a physician and surgeon, of which, of course, his father was very proud of that. And uh, But Bernie was different. Uh, his, his father liked to paint and write poetry and so on. Uh, Bernie loved uh, the stage. Bernie liked to uh, perform in Connecticut Playmakers. Uh, he performed in, uh, um, uh, in um, uh, Little Abner. As a matter of fact, my wife told me about an amusing incident uh, with Bernie uh, that happened in a performance of Little Abner. Because uh, she was in Playmakers. At that. She wasn't in that performance. She was doing scenery and that sort of thing, but it, this really happened. Uh, <laughs> Bernie Nemoyton always would get the, the, the sort of the, the, the character actor parts. He was in acting in Gilbert and Sullivan and he always got the, he, he played uh, Coco the Lord Executioner and uh, Major General Stanley did the patter songs and did them very well too, I might add. And, um, but he played Marrying Sam. So there's a performance of Little Abner, uh, Playmakers in Greenwich, and Bernie Nemoyton, Dr. Nemoyton, is marrying Sam, okay? This really happened in the intermission. There was a classic cry, is there a doctor in the house? Someone became ill in the audience. <laughs> and out came Bernie Nemoyton and his marrying Sam Calfit. <laughs> Run down into the audience, <laughs> looked at the person. They had an ambulance come for them, uh, for that person and so on. Uh, they just, uh, maybe, maybe, I think he said later it was just heat prostration, just simple heat prostration and the excitement of the performance and everything like that. So he stayed there and he, you know, went with the, the patient while they wheeled the, the, the person out. <laughs> they held up the show. <laughs> Can't have that show. I mean, Marion Sam is a key part uh, in that, in that, pl in that uh, musical. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> held it up. <laughs> Person was in the ambulance, he came back, ran down the aisle, ran behind the curtain. They all gave him a standing applause and, and the show went on. Okay. Right. And it was the funniest thing. Did he ever tell you that? No. Yes, and it's true. Virginia said said and then people said afterwards say, Oh, that's nice. That was a nice gimmick, you know. No, <laughs> that was a great gimmick. Wow, what a great gimmick. No, this isn't a gimmick. He said that was a real thing for sec for sure, sure, sure. Okay, you can stop playing now. I'm not playing. Funny, <laughs> and uh, he also did the uh, the patter songs in, in Gilbert. He loved Gilbert and Sullivan, and um, as a matter of fact, my brother-in-law uh, Bruce Adams uh, was was thinking of a um, a career in medicine, but then later he went into uh, computer science and and computer programming. So he was an operating room assistant at St. Joseph's Hospital, and. Um, um, he, he, he said, and I, 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 he told this to me in confidence, but later I, con I confirmed it with Bernie himself. And Bernie said, of course, he said, <laughs> Dr. Bernie Nemoyton would sing Gilbert and Sullivan in the operating room. <laughs> and he said, Bernie said, do you think it's like on television, scalpel, you know, knife, this? He said, he said, that's a bunch of bull, he said, he said. He said, usually it's scalpel, so how's your IBM stock today, you know? Or, or how'd you do in golf today, that sort of thing. 
Uh, no, he said, he said, I didn't lose a single patient. He said, they all, and he did the patter songs while he was taking their appendix out or something like that. <laughs> and he really did. Uh, <laughs> didn't lose a patient, and he was a very successful surgeon, probably in no small part to, to Gilbert and Sullivan. At the meetings here, he would just say, oh, uh, you know, he would, he would always in, in, in interject something on about Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, a very conscientious person, publicly. Uh, he was a member of the Board of Education for years. I think he was president of the Board of Education. Very, very conscientious about education in the community. Uh, and when we had the exhibit about his father here, the Jewish Historical Society and Stanford Historical Society, Bernie Nemoyton was an uh, integral part of putting on that uh, exhibit. We could not have done it without him. He was really, Lester Sherlock and I agreed that, without Bernie Nemoyton to give us the insight into uh, and, and telling us about the objects on display and about the background and everything else like that, it, it was just, just really just fascinating and very important. We couldn't have had the caliber of the exhibit we had without, without Bernie Nemoyton's assistance. No, no two ways about it. What about Russ Bastido's influence on that exhibit? It was important too, but but because this was Bernie's father, that was different. Also, Russell Bastido was is not a, a, a medical a practitioner where Bernie is. So when we had to borrow uh, items, medical items from a museum of medicine and dentistry in, in I believe West Hartford, Bernie knew exactly the right type of instruments for the right era to, 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 to uh, borrow. Uh, you, that's a very highly specialized type of knowledge that we just couldn't, I mean, Lester and I, Russell Bastida, we, we had no idea, uh, but he did. He knew exactly what to call them, what the technical terms were and everything. So this, this was, I mean, all, all the kidding aside about Gilbert and Sullivan, when it came to very serious things, he, he, was, he was very, very serious too. He had his very, very serious um, moments of really a, dedi a person dedicated to the Stanford community, no doubt about it. A and a wonderful man, too. A really a wonderful man. Any other reflections? Oh, on the Nemoyton exhibit, I suppose I should uh, say that uh, of all the exhibits I worked on, and that was, was a lot of work, Lester will tell you, it was a, it was a commitment. Um, two things. Uh, the um, hmm. I can't think of his name now. Well, that's pathetic. The, the physician who was in medical school with Bernie, who was yes. Jacob yeah. Nemoyton saved his right. life. Well, yeah. What was his name? It was an Italian name. That's no, Polish. I... Polish? Polish. Yeah. Yeah. Romanowitz? No. 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 Was... Oh, well, this is pathetic. Yeah. Now I have an excuse. I'm a senior citizen, so I can say it's a senior moment, okay? <laughs> Anyhow, um, there's this wonderful story. And it's true that um, um, uh, there was a young uh, Polish boy in Stanford who Dr. Jacob Moyton saved his life. And the family was poor. And uh, uh, um, he, uh, there was a, like an abscess in the chest. And the only way they could, before antibiotics, anything was just to make an incision, insert a drain and pray. And it was done on the kitchen table of the family's house. And, uh, oh, I can't think of this doctor's name. I'll think of it at 10 o'clock tonight. Rudomansky. Thank you, Dr. Victor Rudomansky. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Victor Rudomansky. Okay, at least I remember the first name. Rudomansky was the name. And this young boy would see Dr. Jacob Nemoyton and he would he would say, oh, here comes my doctor, and so on. Then the family moved, and he never heard from him again. Until Bernie went to medical school, and as he was, you, waited, you have to sign in your name, 
And so Bernie signed in his name, and the fellow behind him said, yelled out to Bernie, wait a minute, wait a minute, he said, he said please come back, come back. He said, he said, he said your name's Nemoyton, a doctor named Nemoyton saved my life when I was a child. Same person, Victor Rudimansky. And he later became a well-known um, um, uh, uh, pediatric uh, physician. And so Lester Sherlock and I were wondering, is he, is he still alive and so on? So, so we checked the medical directory and he was listed, okay, okay. But, and so we contact him. Turns out he was really semi-retired and his, his wife, oh, he was, oh, he, he went on and on about Dr. Nemoyton and how's Bernie and he said, you know how these things are. You go to college and you, you, you just don't see each other again and so on. I'd love to see him. And so... Um, we, we told him about the exhibit, and oh, wonderful, and so on. He said, oh, but he said, I don't know, he said, I don't drive anymore, my wife's not well, and so forth, but he said, he said, he said, but, you know, well, if you change your mind, please come. Okay, thank you. And um, so the, the opening day of the exhibit, Lester and I were here early. We opened this building, and believe me, we were just about living here. And again, uh, our spouses, uh, we owe a lot to them for their understanding and their patience. So we come here early, Lester and I are here, and we see this old fellow sitting on the front steps reading a newspaper. Who's that? Oh, oh. So Lester and I went up, you know, good morning, are, are you waiting for something? Yes, he said, my name is Victor Rudomonsky, may I come in? <laughs> oh, my land, it was like something out of the blue, so they're, oh, so we in, we turned our lights on, showed him. Her. Oh, he was—he he, was—he was actually crying. He was—it was very emotional for him. We asked him if he would speak, and he said, "No, I can't." He said, "He said he's in tears. I can't." But he said, "But maybe. Let me think, please." Can and he was—he was in a one gallery. He said, "Can I just be here by myself?" He says, "Sure." You know, obviously, he wanted a good cry, and so we thought, "Well." And he came out later, and he, 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 he said he would like to say a few words, and it was wonderful. It was just absolutely amazing. Here was a man who was a child. This physician who we were honoring in this exhibit saved this, this man's life, who later grew up to be a well-known and recognized a pediatric physician. It was just a, a very, very, very moving moment, involved, especially for Bernie, too, uh, seeing him again. So it was a very, very, very moving experience for all of us there. I mean, Dr. Victor Rudomonsky here, it was just, just wonderful. And, uh, uh, the, the, these, are, these, are the, these are the high points. Uh, uh, th this makes up for all the, the various trials and tribulations uh, when you're in the historical uh, preservation uh, field. Because there's so many disappointments. There's so many, oh, if I had only known, I'd throw it out. Or you come later on. It, well, I have things for you. Well, no, would you have? Any? Oh, well, you wanted those, well, we threw them out. You know, we've all experienced that, and you don't know whether to cry or scream or curse when people do that. So this makes up an occasion like Dr. Victor Rudomansky made up for all those disappointments that do happen. But again, in life, nothing is perfect. No one is perfect. Nothing is perfect. But golly, that was that was really a, a high point, a very high point for for both our respective historical societies. Well, on that high point, uh, it's only fair to thank you for contributing to the oral history archive. No. You have, uh, and actually, uh, the archive, uh, you know, will be available through the Stanford Historical Society as well. Thank so. You. Uh, I think you've done a very nice job for somebody who is so difficult to talk to. <laughs> <laughs>